Hundreds of thousands of people are calling for the pardon of a convicted killer after the Netflix series Making a Murderer exposed possible flaws in the case that put him behind bars. Now, the show's producers say the legal system failed. So, could this convict soon be free? We're going to talk to a reporter who covered the case. But first, here's Dean Reynolds. Thanks to a show on Netflix, the website change.org has a big hit on its hands. We have Stephen Avery in custody, though. In less than a month, more than a quarter of a million people around the world have signed a petition on the site demanding justice for a man in prison for life and featured in a Netflix documentary. Mike Jones is with change.org. For it to go from a few thousand signatures to upwards of a quarter million signers is phenomenal. Really shows that this petition is tapping into a national conversation. I didn't know what to do, how to handle it. It's all due to this series, Making a Murderer, launched last month, which tells the story of Stephen Avery. He's the Wisconsin man who served 18 years in prison for rape before being exonerated in 2003. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of... Only to find himself in prison again on a murder conviction in 2007. Since its debut, millions of viewers have spent hours binge-watching it and discussing the case in online chat rooms. Many viewers concluded Avery was framed by authorities who lied and planted evidence. Ken Kratz, who prosecuted Avery and is now receiving death threats, says the series is misleading. Absolutely. Stephen Avery is right where he needs to be. Uh, that's uh, uh, in prison uh, for the rest of his natural life. Avery's lawyer, Dean Strang, says, though, that the reaction to the series has included useful information for the defense. We can't afford not to at least sift and consider something that might be useful to one human being who right now is facing a slow death in prison. Here in Wisconsin, Governor Scott Walker has the power to pardon someone, but during two terms in office, he has never used it. And aides say he has no intention of changing that policy. Our thanks to Dean Reynolds. Tom Kirscher is with the Milwaukee <coughs> Journal Sentinel and PolitiFact. He's featured in the series and has covered the case from the very beginning, and he joins us now. Tom, thanks for being with us. Hey, you bet. So, so I watched this series from beginning to end, not knowing anything about it, and I felt that I was on the edge of my seat. And frankly, at the end of it, I was surprised with how the series ends. We should tell some of our viewers there might be some spoilers in our discussion <laughs> here. So, what I saw in the series, and what millions of other viewers, uh, millions of other viewers saw, you were there. Does it do a good job of explaining? the case? You know, I think there's a, a couple things to keep in mind, uh, particularly for viewers or people who are just getting bits and pieces now that it's gotten so much attention. And one is that uh, as thorough and as well done as, as the Netflix series is, it was done uh, from the point of view of Stephen Avery's uh, family and his lawyers, the, the filmmakers, you know, from the time they started working on the on the series or on the filming um, were, you know, in effect embedded with the family and the lawyers. So I think that doesn't detract at all from points they raise that are good for discussion, that are good for investigation, no question about that. At the same time, when you're evaluating the film, I think you need to recall that, that it does come from one point of view. Yeah, and we should point out that the yeah. filmmakers did say that they did reach out several times to the family of Teresa Hallback, the <laughs> young woman uh, who was murdered there, um, and that they refused to participate in this. Is there anything else in the series that you saw in the series compared to what you saw as you were reporting the story there throughout the entire time? You know, I think the series does a good job of raising questions about some of the ways in which the murder investigation was handled. So. Um, at the time of this, of the, the murder victim's death, Stephen Avery was suing Manitowoc County for his wrongful conviction, and uh, so there was a you know, natural sort of conflict of interest with Manitowoc investigating him for the murder. And even though the investigation was transferred over to a neighboring county, there were Manitowoc County sheriffs, uh, deputies investigating the murder and uh, finding some of the key evidence. So the, the film does a good job of saying, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here? This county wasn't supposed to be involved at all. And lo and behold, for example, 
you know, one of the Manitowoc deputies finds the key to the murder victim's car in Stephen Avery's bedroom. Yeah, and and you know the, that that was that was something clearly that was surprising in watching the series. And I got to ask you, Tom, the one thing for me as I watched this, and I think for a lot of other people when we were watching this series, is the videotape confessions that we saw of Mr. Avery's uh, nephew Brendan Dassey, who was then 16 years old at the time. Um, you know, look, we, we only saw portions of it, but clearly Mr. Dassey was somebody who seemed a little bit uh, out of his depth, out of his league. Uh, there are some reports that uh, he, his IQ wasn't at a normal, uh, at the, the, the IQ that normal people have. And it just definitely felt as if he didn't know what was going on. Because I remember at one point he said, well, can I go back to school after this uh, yeah. confession? And... So what, what were people saying then, and what did your reporting show when it came to Mr. Dassey? You know, one of the uh, regrets I guess I have from watching Making a Murder is that I didn't cover the Dassey trial. So Stephen Avery went on trial first, was found guilty of the murder. Dassey's trial was later, and I did not cover that. And, and so I can't speak nearly as well to that part of the case, but I... You know, judging by the reaction from viewers, you know, and uh, Twitter and elsewhere, I, and there's no question there's a lot of concern for how uh, Dassey, the nephew, was investigated. He was 16 at the time, learning disabled, sometimes being interrogated without his attorney being present. So uh, there's certainly uh, a lot to uh, review there. I, I, I guess I would just say, though, getting back to Avery for a minute, um, you know, while the series does raise good questions about how who was involved in the investigation. It's important to remember, too, there was a lot of DNA evidence that uh, implicated Avery. Um, some irony here in that uh, uh, Stephen Avery was freed from prison after 18 years by DNA that proved he didn't commit a sexual assault back in 1985. And obviously, DNA evidence is, is uh, powerful. And it was in this case. You know, there was his DNA found in and on the murder victim's car. There was her DNA found uh, in the remains uh, that were found outside of Stephen Avery's house. And there was his DNA found uh, on the key of her car found in his house. And finally, there was the murder victim's DNA found on a bullet uh, in Avery's garage. So, you know, while there are certainly questions to be raised about the nature or the, the process of the investigation, there was also a lot of DNA evidence that uh, apparently held a lot of sway with the jury. For sure, and we always, as you know, uh, Tom, when we're reporting stories out like this, we we should note again and again that a woman lost her life uh, in, in a very brutal circumstance. And so and we understand that the family's pain um, is one that is tremendous. Um, there right. was a scene in the making of the murder series where it appeared, uh, the way the, uh, the series was shot, that there was some kind of a tamp tampering that was done with Mr. Avery's blood that was already in custody of authorities. Um, and there, was, there seemed to be sort of a smoking gun moment. And then we found out afterwards that the uh, prosecutors were able to get the FBI to conduct the test that the defense says didn't exist. And they even said before <laughs> the test was, uh, was concluded that the prosecutors were going to somehow be able to convince the FBI to create a test that would prove that this blood evidence uh, did not come from the evidence locker. What did you make of that? Yeah, I think that is a tough one for the viewer, and, and I would imagine for the jury as well. You know, on the one hand, you've got uh, the credibility of the FBI, somebody at uh, an expert out in Virginia doing this testing, not somebody local who might be compromised in some way. This national expert saying, look, this test shows that uh, Avery's DNA in the, in the blood of the Werner victim's car came from him bleeding, not from some blood vial that may have been tampered with. At the same time, you know, the jury is told and the viewers see that this isn't a test that's done very often. It was done back in the O.J. Simpson murder trial, and, and it was like, wait a minute, what's this test all about? On the one hand, it seems like an obscure test. On the other hand, the FBI experts certainly testified with near certainty that uh, the blood vial was not tampered with and that any of Avery's blood in the murder victim's car was from Avery himself. Um, Tom, before I let you go, uh, we mm -hmm. have heard reports that there are some jurors that have come out and reportedly told the filmmakers that they thought that Mr. Avery was innocent, um, but that they found him guilty be because they feared retaliation from the sheriff's department. Um, I guess the question I think 
a lot of viewers will have. And it seems to me, irregardless of how you, whether or not you believe Mr. Avery committed this crime or you didn't, do you feel that this series sort of exposed the criminal justice system in the United States in a way that we haven't seen before, especially when it comes to uh, the, the economics of it, you know, that these were clearly people who don't have a lot of money and how justice works for some people versus others. Did you feel like that way as well? That's certainly uh, part of the story here. You know, Stephen Avery came from a arguably, you know, lower middle class family, kind of a uh, reclusive family and, and uh, you know, with not a lot of means, not necessarily a lot of education. And so, you know, at the same time, it's probably been a worry of the American justice system for a long time, you know, what happens to, to more vulnerable people. That being said, you know, he had two of the best defense attorneys in Wisconsin representing him, so it wasn't a case where, um, you know, a, a person of little means was represented by an over, overburdened public defender. These were top flight attorneys. And you know, in terms of the justice system as a whole, the filmmaker said, look, we weren't here to try to determine Avery's guilt or innocence. We were here to to uh, investigate and, and uh, show what the justice system is like. And I think, you know, those are certainly noble goals. And I take the word of the filmmakers that that's what they're trying to do. But again, it's important to to remember that since the story really is told from one side, I think a key question here is, um, you know, how fair to the justice system is the film? If you're if you're telling it essentially from a defense perspective, uh, certainly you've got many valid points to bring out. But if you're people are drawing sort of a sweeping conclusion about the entire justice system in Manitowoc or in Wisconsin or in America, you know, that's that's a a much bigger reach. For sure, for sure. Uh, and as you pointed out, uh, Tom, uh, again, we, uh, our hearts and our thoughts are with the family of Teresa right. Holbeck, who lost her life there. Agreed. Tom Kersher, who is a reporter with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. He covered this story from start to finish. Tom, we really appreciate your insight. Thanks so much. Thank you.